Greetings, everybody. Let's wait a couple minutes, one minute, and let people connect. Welcome to a new Peace Engineering Echo Collaborative. We need a new mindset where we can imagine, design, and create new solutions for the global challenges. A couple of notices. This session is being recorded. Please type your name, email, and affiliation in the chat so we can know who participated. If you're not speaking, please mute yourself. Uh, there's a lot of background noise can be very disturbing. We will have a question and answer session at the end. We are monitoring the chat. So please ask your questions, type them in and with your name and also affiliation. And depending where you are connected from, we may have some bandwidth issues. So you may want to turn off the, the video that really consumes a lot of bandwidth. This is a collaborative on an introduction to the health impacts due to climate change. We are facing, many scientists say, in the, we're in the path of extin extinction. The earth is resilient. Nature will adapt itself. Does nature need humans? That's the question. Next, please. I have the pleasure of introducing a colleague, Dr. Heidi Rogers. She's a nurse practitioner. She works with a UNM ECHO program. She's also connected to the national labs. Uh, it's a great honor to be working with her. We are we have joined forces to develop content for the peace engineering minor here at UNM and graduate program now that we're starting. So Heidi, I'm gonna turn the microphone to you and I wanna thank you again for your talk. Hi everyone and, and welcome. Um, like Ramiro said, I'm, I'm Heidi Rogers. I'm a family nurse practitioner. I'm also an advanced practice holistic nurse, which is a specialty in nursing. Um, I've worked in primary care and rural health in New Mexico now for almost 25 years. And I have the pleasure of being the director of the Office of Interprofessional Education for the UNM Health Sciences Center. And I'm a assistant professor at the UNM College of Nursing. Um, a couple of years ago, I shifted my focus from um, addiction, which is a really complex, chronic problem that I had spent most of my career working on, to climate change, which is uh, even more complex. <laughs> um, and I've and I've spent um, the last couple of years really learning more about climate change and pollution and environmental health and how that impacts human and population health, both locally in New Mexico and, and globally. The talk that I'm uh, about to give, um, I'm gonna share my screen and um, we'll run through the talk. Um, before that, or while you're, you're sitting there, I'd be curious to have um, folks introduce themselves on the chat, where they're coming from, if you've noticed any impacts from climate change in your own community, if you could say what those are. And also if you've noticed any health impacts um, for yourself or your, your family or your community um, from the climate change that you're currently experiencing. Um, again, type in other questions as the, as the talk goes on um, and we will grab those at the end and then we'll have some time to um, to really, uh, I think, explore some possible problem sets and solutions from the peace engineering community at the end, or that's my hope. So climate change and human health. So these are the objectives that we set for ourselves for this talk. Um, they're in no... Uh, they're, they're fairly elaborate, um, so we'll hope, hope that we grab hold of all of these. Um, but first, what we're going to do is just review the environmental impacts of climate change and how these connect to current and future health outcomes for humans. 
integrate the concepts of environmental, human, and planetary health um, to share how our health and well being is really interconnected with our natural and built environments. We're going to explore problem sets in the areas of mitigation and adaptation to improve the climate change related human health outcomes going forward. And that's your job. So we're going to be thinking about that together at the end. And we're also going to have an open dialogue on how to support ongoing innovation, research, community engagement, and community community led policy and program implementation towards justice and equity for our local national and global communities. So I'll just say I'm not a climate scientist, but this is what I've learned. Um, this is climate science in a nutshell. And all of these areas are areas that I'm going to um, focus a little bit more on as the slides progress. Um, but just to understand climate change, um, it all starts with air pollution. Um, air pollution is the cause of global climate change. Um, and, and air pollution is fairly significant um, environmental health problem and human health problem in and of itself. One of the things that air pollution causes besides um, smoggy and, and, and you know, crappy air is um, ocean acidification. So as we're um, creating all this air pollution, it's going over the oceans, the oceans are sucking it in. And, um, and the oceans are changing um, their pH because of this, um, which has its own, which is its own human health problem set um, and obviously ocean health problem set. Um, air pollution is also causing global warming. Um, global warming is causing um, ocean temperatures to rise and, and shift in different areas, which is changing global weather patterns. Um, and, and how ocean currents are working and also how air currents and weather patterns are working. Um, global warming is also causing um, uh, warming of the polar ice caps um, and melting of the polar ice caps, which is causing sea level rise. Um, the changes in the ocean patterns and the weather patterns are causing more, um, so causing more extreme weather um, events to happen, and also um, just stronger storms, um, particularly ocean storms, um, is a is a complex um, uh, or, or is a is a component to that. Um, things that we're experiencing on our land um, areas are really uh, a lot more flooding, particularly in in wetter areas. A lot more extreme heat and drought, um, particularly in the um, areas that have been traditionally drier and um, also a lot more wildfires. So let's just start with air pollution. So air pollution is nothing short of complex in and of itself. Um, it comes from multiple sources, but the primary sources are in industry and transportation. Um, it's primarily fossil fuels, um, but there are other kinds of air pollution that is coming from um, from different chemicals and volatile organic compounds that we create. Um, some air pollution also comes from the way that we practice agriculture, um, particularly um, modern agriculture. Uh, it also comes from how we manage our waste and um, uh, air pollution when, when, we, when we create it can also, um, there's also a complex process around secondary pollutants. So we may not be emitting those, but because of chemical reactions, um, heat is one of them. We have um, increase in secondary pollutants as well, um, particularly ozone as a complex problem. This slide here on the right um, just is, tries to be an illustration of what we know um, on, of the health effects of, um, of pollution. So we've linked um, higher levels of pollution to um, increased incidence of stroke. Um, we've linked it to autism and increased incidence of autism. Um, also attention deficit or hyperactivity disorder is, is correlated with air pollution levels um, and cognitive decline, both Alzheimer's and dementia is linked to um, air pollution and air quality. We also experience um, more respiratory diseases like asthma and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease because of air pollution. 
because it, because air pollution, when we take it into our body, causes inflammation and our own immune system to um, to overreact. That inflammation is linked to heart disease, um, so cardiovascular disease, which is one piece of it is stroke. The other piece is um, heart attacks and um, and venous insufficiency, just different problems with our blood vessels. Um, air pollution is also an endocrine disruptor, so it mucks up our endocrine system. It's correlated and linked with type 2 diabetes incidents. Um, and because it impairs our ability to um, bring in oxygen and it causes inflammation, it also, in our bodies, um, it's also um, correlated with preterm um, uh, births and poor pregnancy outcomes. So in a nutshell, air pollution is not great. Um, or it's not even good at all. It actually, the World Health Organization um, has set standards for air pollution levels and, um, and globally nine out of 10 people live in communities where the air pollution exceeds um, what we think might be safe standards um, for air pollution levels. So it's, it's a global problem. So like I said before, air pollution also causes ocean acidification. Um, and as communities, we are also dumping um, lots of chemicals and pollutants into our ocean systems. Um, right now, we're expecting that the ocean acidity levels will double by 2100. We've all, so by the end of this century, um, which is extremely concerning for a lot of reasons. Um, but it's already moved by a 0.1 in the pH scale, which has caused, um, as many of us know, um, bleaching of coral reefs um, and shifting of ecological systems. Um, what we're worried about with ocean acidification and contamination is um, it's a, the ocean is a major source of food and protein intake for a large part of the global population. We actually estimate that 4.5 billion of the 7.8 billion people on our planet get at least 15% of their protein intake from the sea. Um, so, so as the seas change and our ability um, and, and fish and our ability to safely um, uh, feed ourselves from the ocean shifts over the next century, um, we're, we're going to dramatically um, increased malnutrition, or, or that's what we're, ex we're expecting and we're worried about. Um, it's also causing loss of kelp forests, which are a really important ecological um, source of, of both oxygen and carbon sequestration, and also um, just environments um, for fish, food for fish, and food for many coastal communities. Um, the news this week actually was the loss of the major kelp forests around the Baja Peninsula um, and the coast of California and the, um, in North America. Um, ocean acidification also um, can increase human hazards and injuries from um, larger jellyfish populations that are happening and moving closer to coastal areas. Um, the contamination is, is definitely causing concerns for water safety. Um, I, I'm sure everyone knows that um, there's high mercury content in larger fish, larger bottom dwelling fish, um, because there's a lot of mercury that's been deposited from different chemical sources on the bottom of the ocean. I've personally, as a nurse practitioner, seen somebody with mercury poisoning from a diet that was heavy in canned tuna fish. Um, so it's something that's some, it's very concerning for the health of a lot of, um, you know, for human health. Um, there are a lot of medical resources that we, um, that we tap from the ocean and we're worried that the acidification and this contamination is gonna shift that. Um, and certainly in terms of the, the um, coastal communities and the island communities, um, there's a lot of loss of livelihoods, which does have direct impact on health for multiple reasons. Um, but one of them is, is migration, which is probably um, the hardest health determinant is people having to move um, because they can no longer live in a, in a community. And then solastalgia. I don't know if anyone's heard the word solastalgia, but that's just 
sadness from loss of natural places. Um, so as we see the coral reefs um, and the Great Barrier Reef um, bleaching and dying, um, that causes a um, collective grief. Um, we call that soul nostalgia. And that's one of the health um, consequences from, uh, from climate change that, that we're all experiencing. So like I said before, air pollution causes global warming as well. So um, this is just an image to take a look at for global warming. We've, um, as many of you know, uh, we are currently trying to keep global warming from going over 1.5 degrees Celsius from pre-industrial levels. Um, we've already exceeded that um, in many communities. So if you take a look at this, you'll see that global warming actually is, is different over the whole planet. So it's not just everyone is increasing by one degree Celsius or two degrees Celsius. Some communities are increasing more and some, some communities are increasing less. Um, so this is just a map to kind of, you know, just get a visual that it's not the same everywhere. And if you see, you know, the Arctic Circle is actually the, um, the place at the top that's um, getting, has, has already experienced um, the most um, heat and, uh, and between two and four degrees Celsius, and that's, um, that's to 19, 2019. <clears throat> so as I said before, global warming also causes changes in ocean current patterns and weather patterns. And um, the shifts in these weather patterns mean that weather for all of us on the planet is a little less predictable than it's been. Um, uh, it also means that we've got increased extreme weather, which is its own risk factor, and um, and we'll talk about that a little bit in a, in in a in a slide. Um, there's also increased ferocity of ocean weather. So I don't know if you've noticed, but we've had over the last ten years more Category Four hurricanes and cyclones, ocean storms than um, we'd ever previously had. So. Um, these storms are impacting our communities and in different ways impacting, um, impacting our health. The changes in the ocean current patterns are making wet areas wetter, uh, proning, uh, you know, so that means that wet areas are getting more and more water and more and more um, flooding and mudslides and dry areas are getting drier. Um, but at the same time, the storm severity is also increasing. So as dry areas get drier, um, and we'll talk about this a little bit, um, then they get super intense storms and that actually um, has another dramatic uh, impact. So it's, it's interconnected. And, uh, and this is impacting the socioeconomic base and infrastructure in, in communities all over the world, both inland and coastal. So we've talked about the Arctic Circle and um, and sea level rise and these uh, the the polar ice caps, which have hold a lot of have been held, holding a lot of water up off the top of the ocean and will be um, will be continuing to melt. We're expecting, I think, um, fifteen meters of of uh, sea level rise um, for most coastal communities. Um, at some point in the next hundred years. Um, I put these images up because for a long time, we thought about polar ice caps and um, melting, and we saw these images of these sad polar bears. And um, that's an image that not very many, you know, it's, it's, it's sad, we, we have feelings for it, but it's not really an image that helps us understand what it is that we're going to be experiencing. And so we're trying to shift the communication towards the second image, which is really maps of what we're expecting is gonna happen as these polar ice caps melt and the sea level rises, where are the land places that are gonna be underwater? Um, and, and it's fairly, uh, fairly stark. <clears throat> As coastal sea levels are rising, um, this, inc this impacts infrastructure. Certainly um, sewer infrastructure is a huge problem because as these get flooded or are, are broken down by the 
um, sea level rising or the um, tides rising, those kinds of things, and also these increased storms. Um, as sewer as sewage gets out, it causes a great deal of con contamination and a significant, significant problem for human health in, in those communities and also um, obviously fish and water and ecological system health. Um, it also impairs abilities for com coastal communities to get fresh water um, and, it, um, and it works on infrastructure and energy systems. So um, it's really, these kinds of things are really devastating for coastal communities. Um, then coastal communities as the sea levels are rising are also more vulnerable to extreme weather events, particularly these uh, more ferocious ocean, ocean storms. Um, and all this causes displacement, right? So migration, um, social disruption, people have to move, people can't live the way that they had been living in coastal communities. In island communities, um, there's several islands that are being slowly relocated right now because they're not going to make it in the next 50 years. Those island communities are gonna be underwater. Um, there's a community in the Gulf of Mexico that's also being relocated. Um, uh, and so, um, you know, just massive displacement and social disruption is happening because of this. And certainly it's contributing in terms of um, health impacts to food security, um, to safety. It it's, um, has a huge mental health um, cost to it. There's injury, there's um, access to care issues um, as infrastructure is falling, uh, falling apart. So we're also experiencing shorter winters. So as the planet is um, warming up, our winters are shorter and, um, and much of the planet actually relies on winter snowpack for surface water. Um, and so as that snowpack is decreasing, it's decreasing the amount of surface water and fresh surface water um, that many inland communities um, have access to. Um, these shorter winters also impact agriculture, so um, potentially um, longer growing seasons in some areas, which could be good, but also um, devastating growing seasons in other areas where some, some trees and plants actually require a longer dormant period in between um, their fruit making or food um, production periods. Um, so this is impacting our ability to grow um, food quite a bit. Um, shorter winters are causing um, a huge shift in bee, bee, bee behaviors and pollination. Um, as we know, pollination is a key component of a lot of fruit and some vegetable um, cultivation globally. And as our um, global bee populations are, um, are falling uh, and shorter winters are, are contributing to that, there's a lot of contributions to why our bee pollen populations are falling, but, um, but this is one of them. Um, we're also having longer allergy seasons. Um, I just read an article just recently from the CDC that 30% of uh, um, US Americans are experiencing um, allergies. So one third of our population um, has a long season of sneezing and being miserable. Allergies and asthma are, are um, Something that happens as <clears throat> as um, uh, as these you know as we have these shorter winters, um, where this is also causing um, you know shorter winters means that pests um, or what we consider pests to human health um, don't have die off seasons and rebirth seasons, so they just continue to um, to spread and flourish and grow. So ticks. I spelled wrong. Um, I'll change that later. But ticks um, uh, were, are increasing and also moving to areas that they've never been in before. And that's true for a lot of other um, rodents and mosquitoes. And um, so we've, we've got a change in, in that. Um, it's also causing a problem with our soil microbiome, which um, is key component of um, food security and our ability to grow food. Um, certainly contributing to bark beetle infestation and other um, infestations in forests that then predispose them to uh, drought and wild, predispose them to wildfire 
from drought. Um, we've got shifts in bat and bird and butterfly migrations. Um, and then, like I said at the beginning, um, less snowpack and a deficit in surface water. So um, again, shorter winters are contributing to migration, which is one of the biggest human health impacts from climate change. And extreme weather. So um, we're having more tornadoes, more massive lightning storms, more hurricanes, more cyclones. Um, we've got more heat waves. We've got more droughts. We've got more dust storms. Um, we've also got shifts in the polar vortex that's happening, um, more Arctic freezes, um, more torrential rain and flooding. And all of this, every time we have an extreme weather event, what, we're, what we experience are power outages, um, impaired transportation, um, infrastructure problems, loss of housing and community resources or community um, infrastructure, grocery stores, hospitals, um, those kinds of things. Um, we're, we're getting more and more food insecurity from these events. So, um, so the food systems are disrupted. Um, certainly death and injuries are um, something that happens with extreme weather um, events and, um, you know, loss of healthcare access, increase in vector and waterborne diseases. Um, we get too hot, we get too cold, so hyperthermia, hypothermia, um, certainly um, a huge amount of mental health disorders happen after extreme weather events just from loss of place, um, loss of social infrastructure. And then, um, you know, one of the biggest things again is displacement or migration because of extreme weather events. And we're experiencing more flooding globally um, in, in, you know, river basins and flood prone areas and also coastal communities. Um, flooding um, impacts our um, agriculture land and crops. And so um, it impairs our ability to grow food. Um, we, we experience, just like extreme weather, loss of housing and community buildings, um, certainly drowning and death, loss of pets. Um, we have diminished access to food and medicine and water in flooded communities. Um, our communities experience financial and property losses. Um, you know, one of the biggest public health problems is increased storm and sewer system overloads. So as these communities flood, the sewage floods out into the water and into the community um, and different bacteria can grow and um, algae blooms. And um, so there's just a lot. Um, and then plus vector borne diseases, malaria, um, Zika, uh, those kinds of things happen more in these flood prone areas because of this ecological system shift. And like everything, um, mental health problems and displacement and migration are um, um, mental or are some of the health consequences that we get from flooding. And then we're experiencing more extreme heat. So um, you know, extreme heat is um, dangerous for us as humans and plants and animals to be in. So um, extreme heat. Um, causes death. Um, we, you know, what we, um, what we've been experiencing, and this is just a, a quote from, um, from the World Health Organization, we've got an increased exposure to extreme heat, which is currently at 2.9 billion person days per year. And that's 475 million more person days than last year. So, um, so, it's worse and, and, you know, heat is worse for the elderly and also infants. Um, and I misquoted that that's from the Lancet countdown to climate and health, which I'll link to later, um, which is a global um, report that comes out annually. So extreme heat um, is, is really hard to live in. It's worse in um, urban areas. Um, and you can see this little illustration below when, when we're in concrete or asphalt communities, um, the heat gets absorbed into those um, structures and is actually increased sometimes by 15 to 20 degrees Celsius um, uh, for the people that are living in those, in those places. So 
um, you know, one of the complexities from um, extreme weather events is that it takes out power um, infrastructure. What we've seen when power goes out is that elderly and nursing homes um, perish from the heat because their power, um, uh, they don't have power for their air conditioning systems. And, um, and certainly um, people in these communities, um, you know, die because of exposure. Um, there was the, a couple of years ago, there was a heat wave and over 15,000 people died in Paris in one summer from heat. Um, so we've, you know, it's just, this is a, you know, huge consequence and certainly something that as peace engineers, we need to be thinking about how do we help um, decrease these um, uh, effects from, from extreme heat and these urban heat island effects. So heat causes heat stress and heat stroke. Um, it causes dehydration. It um, dramatically impacts outdoor um, construction and agriculture workers. Um, it causes kidney failure. So when we're in an extreme heat environment, our kidneys can shut down. Um, it certainly causes mental health emergencies and violence. There's a lot of data about violence, domestic violence, interpersonal violence increasing on hotter days. Um, so that's um, uh, that's a you know obviously a huge health problem um, for our communities. Heat puts a lot of stress on our body, and we have more heart attacks and strokes on high heat days. Um, so emergency rooms are inundated not only with dehydration, um, heat stress and heat stroke, um, but also cardiovascular um, events as well. It makes our respiratory system um, have to work harder and it causes exacerbations of asthma and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Um, there's a huge economic loss of work hours globally because of extreme heat and um, which, you know, Im impacts the workers because they're not getting paid and it impacts the ability for, um, uh, for infrastructure to be maintained um, and built. There's an acute loss of agriculture. So extreme heat days boils the soil, uh, kills the microbes, and it's really um, hard to next to impossible for that soil to become um, supportive of nature again um, af after an extreme heat event. And, um, and also a dramatic um, evaporation of surface water. So dr really impairs our ability to, um, uh, to have um, fresh water for drinking and, uh, and certainly is correlated with migration. We're experiencing that a lot in North America right now. There's um, a lot of heat and drought in um, Central America and Mexico and um, folks are migrating North because um, it's impossible for them to, um, or it's difficult for them to live there. And drought. Um, so extreme we, heat, global warming. I, oh, go ahead. I want to, I want to interrupt you. Can we speed it up? We're going to run out of time. That's all. Yes, Thank absolutely. You. Drought also bad for health. <laughs> um, and so you can see here sort of what the issues are um, with, with surface water, switching to groundwater is something that has to happen with drought. Um, groundwater has different contaminants often. Um, and, uh, and then also, you know, food security, um, huge impact on food security. Drought leads to wildfires. We've had an increased daily exposure of wildfires over the last 15 years um, by 58% in um, 114 out of 196 countries on the planet. Um, wildfires are really bad for air pollution. They're really bad for human respiratory and cardiovascular health. Um, and they also cause a huge loss of nature and disruption of infrastructure, um, contributing to um, habitat changes, um, mental health changes for humans. So this is just a summary slide that we use that's from the CDC that talks about sort of what the impacts of climate change are on human health, just to give everyone a little bit of a, um, you know, snapshot of what I just tried to go through. And, um, and this is a slide of, um, you know, just pictures of urban slums and some um, urban solutions around 
um, shading structures with solar panels, which is an interesting um, climate hack for all of us. Um, one of the reasons that I put this slide in here is that 60% um, of our global population, so the largest uh, uh, populations of humans are moving into urban slums. So this represents an acute area for human health problems from climate change. Um, and is something that um, we, you know, we all live near urban areas and all urban areas have urban slums. These are areas that we need to focus on. Okay, how are we doing on time, Romero? We are, we should speed it up, we're okay. Okay. So, um, so one of the things um, that we wanted to thank you. One of the things that we wanted to bring in is just this idea of deep adaptation. This is a framework that um, has been um, uh, uh, brought to the communities by by an economist named Jem Bendel, um, and it just the framework asks important questions, um, questions that we'd like to be asking ourselves and our communities about um, you know, what do we value most and want to keep? Um, that's our resilience. Um, what do we need to let go of so that we um, don't make matters worse? We need to think about that as we're doing um, community planning. That's our relinquishment. Um, what could we bring back that will help us in these difficult times? That's our restoration. And um, with what and whom shall we make peace as we awaken to our interdependence? So we'll make this slideshow available for folks so you can take a look at some of the resources. And I've included a couple of websites that are super useful um, here. And this is our final slide. And this will open us up into conversations in the Q&A. Um, first, because, of my, because migration is probably the biggest problem for human health globally, um, we need to take a shelter in place approach. So we can't just keep moving populations to where it's it's more habitable. We need to make our we need to make every inch of our globe continue to remain habitable um, or as much as we can. And so these are pictures of some of the nature based solutions um, that we've um, you know that that communities are starting to think about implementing and doing. Um, but it's really important to think about how do we how do we help communities um, live where they are and flourish. Um, so I think with that I'll stop sharing so we can go into gallery. And I appreciate um, everyone's time with my with my talk. Thank you so much, uh, Heidi. This was. Uh an eye opener, I think, at least for me, there, everything is so interconnected. And this is, I think, one of the reasons peace engineering is an emerging new area and we need to connect all the disciplines, science, technology, engineering, arts, the humanities and the social sciences and the health science, right? But they're all interconnected. So uh, it was an awesome, awesome presentation. I would like to open up now for people to ask questions. Donna, can you help us with the questions? Please. Yes, uh, we had a question from Alfredo Soerio. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to ask this question. Great presentation. Thank you very over um, uh, overviewing of what uh, is happening and what is relevant. My question, since uh, I was involved in this question of the uh, global challenge for engineers uh, some years ago uh, and involving the CPD, involving the continuing in engineering education and professional development of engineers. My question is, um, uh, how do we uh, provoke the engineers to dedicate their, their, their expertise and knowledge to <laughs> contribute to the questions and the problems that you present it. I'm just going to give you a big heart and send it over to Romero because I know that he and I have talked a lot about this and he's got a big plan. Oh, good. 
good. I didn't know. So it, it wasn't arranged. Let the others know that this was not combined. Yes. I'm um, just going to say a very few words. Uh, we organized uh, in November 2018 the first global peace engineering conference. And since then, that moving, movement has, uh, has grown globally. We are in the process of changing curricula. We need to sprinkle all these concepts throughout the engineering curricula because it's very rigid. But if we sprinkle all, all these concepts, they will have an impact on our uh, engineering students. I know that NSF, the National Science Foundation at the US is also pivoting around peace engineering. They want to uh, prepare the next generation of researchers to be more become more global citizens, be aware of the global challenges. All these issues that he has brought up, these are en engineering problems that need to be solved. Infrastructure, every model that we have know that we know of, because this is the good thing about COVID. It has made us rethink our existence here. And this is the first wave, this is my opinion, first wave of a pandemic and we should expect more. So we really need to start acting now. There's no time to think about it. No more academic exercises, like I say. We need to get engaged. And, and also we need to be engaged not only in the education network, but with our communities. I'm just gonna stop there. There's a lot more. Alfredo, uh, if you can send me an email, uh, uh, please, I would love to talk to you more extensively. Uh, this is Roger Ram, Ram, I have a question. Yeah, uh, the first time I heard the word peace engineering was from Bernard Amadai, and he talked about the Israelis and the Palestinians working together on water issues. And Israel now, with their water technologies, exports or gives away 5% of its water to Palestine and Jordan to keep the peace there. So peace engineering, you know, from making water resources available uh, through efficiency and technologies, artificial intelligence that is improving the efficiency of water use in agriculture and other places, and also solar energy, other alternate forms of energy which will reduce our GHGs in the atmosphere that you spoke very well, Heidi, about how they are really contributing to so many health impacts. So it is not that we cannot afford what President Biden has laid out as this big infrastructure plan. It is we need more of that. Like Congress, some people are debating $10 trillion because that will really change how we think about energy, water, and basically our needs. We are using more and more electricity for air conditioning, for this, for that, instead of thinking how we can simplify our lives a little bit so we use less water, less energy, produce less waste. So these are things that we have to teach the students and change their mindset from the beginning that we don't just live in this planet to make money and enjoy every second of it, but we are responsible for the others who are to come after us. And we have to, apart with developing technologies, we have to be more you know, prudent, you know, what stewards of the resources that God has given us. Thank you. I, Very uh, well said, Raj. Yeah. Thank you, Ramita. Uh, I'll just add, I teach a um, course at the university called Climate Change and, and Public Health Preparedness. And in that class, we've, um, we've created an assignment for the students who, most of the students come in from um, different areas around New Mexico. So um, this is really a regional university. Um, and the students take a problem from their own community and then walk through a rubric to, um, to really look at the problem, think about how the problem is gonna get worse over time because of climate change, and then um, propose, a, uh, propose a solution around that problem for their community. And I think that one of the things that we can do as educators is really, shift to local grabbable problem sets. Every community is gonna be different what they need to be able to shelter in place. 
um, what they can harness for energy. So some communities can harness solar and some wind and some geothermal um, and, you know, and possibly some also need nuclear and, you know, um, but, but, but if we can start to think as educators about activating our students for local solutions, um, for things that they can grab hold of while there are students, um, because it gets overwhelming. I think everyone knows this. Um, all of the things that are going on on the planet are, are, are so huge. And if we, if we can give our students something to grab um, that's little, you know, um, it's, it's not insignificant, actually. It helps build up their action competence and build up their, the way they see themselves in the world and how they see themselves solving, um, solving problems. So thank you for letting me add that into the conversation. I think that's one of the things we can do as educators. There's a comment here, something that, and you alluded to it, Heidi, is something that is needed globally is environmental regulations and policy. Po the political will has been lacking since 1992, when was the first Earth Summit, it's been uh, just agreements and blessings and there's no political will. Yeah, and I think it's an all hands on deck. You know, I think policy is something, you know, for educating health professionals and, and specifically nurses, I know when a nurse talks, people listen, but the nurses don't, they don't know that and they don't use their voice. Um, to advocate for, for policies and solutions that are important um, for the patients that they're, they're caring for. And, and so, you know, that again, the other thing that we need to do as educators is give students opportunities to really bring that into the, like, the visceral being of our professional identity. Like nurses always need to be advocates. Engineers always need to be advocates. So it's not just about you know, it's, it's bringing that in, I think, to our, our um, yeah, exactly, Raj, you said continuing professional development and citizen awareness um, are critical. And it's true, it's not just our students. We have to, Ramiro was saying this before we opened up this session, it's lifelong learning. We need to bring all, all we're all students. We're continuing to be students. Um, everyone is a student for this. It's not just the people that are enrolled in our education programs. Any other? Question, Donna? Alfredo put up a, a link and um, the Porto Declaration. Um, I don't know, would you like to talk about that a little bit, Alfredo? Well, again, okay, uh, thank you. Um, it's just um, when the International Association of Continuing Engineering Education, uh, which is based now in Georgia Tech, uh, <clears throat> um, had its conference here in Porto five years ago. And we signed, all signed the declarations on the website, uh, the people that signed the declaration to make um, uh, the, the world with the future and um, about the possible contribution of engineers. And the, the point is that uh, uh, the, the engineers that are already uh, working, they take decisions, very important for all of us. Um, and uh, I think it, at that time, we, we thought that it was relevant to, to, to make available uh, continuing education to, to continue engineering education to those that are uh, interested in um, improving their contribution to, to a world with the future. Uh, and uh, we created something which is called Serena uh, website. It's in Australia. It's being managed by our colleagues in Australia that has a compilation of uh, training uh, for engineers uh, related uh, with the question of uh, uh, water uh, sustainability criteria for built environment, et cetera. So I, I think my, my, my question and my, my topic I wanted to raise is that uh, we have to act now. And to act now is about the engineers that are already taking decisions, the ones that uh, uh, may influence um, future actions. Uh, I know that uh, we, we can address the, the, the curriculum for graduates, but the, the, the urgency from my point of view 
and according to the speech that we heard um, from, uh, from the speaker is that we have to address, from Heidi, we have to address um, this question of now. I mean, and CPD is fundamental. So that, that is my contribution to this debate. Thank you. Thank you, Alfredo. Yes, I would like to, if possible, connect with you directly. Uh, the Peace Engineering Consortium, that was an outcome of the first global peace engineering. Uh, Bernard Amade is part, we got people from many universities. Georgia Tech is part of the Peace Engineering Consortium. Uh, I know that Georgia Tech and UNM were in the process of creating a peace engineering center so we can change the way we teach through research and perform outreach because we need to engage with the community. So uh, Alfredo, I would really like to connect with you. This is about all, like Haiti says, all hands on deck. You know, we we're, we're going, I mean, in this country we went from complete denial last administration to now all hands on deck. So it's time to do things. Thank you. Anybody else wanna add something, comment? Before we end, we're running, we're almost at the end of the hour. You, you made us all think, maybe you gave us a lot of homework to think and, <laughs> and, and, and uh, something that we've been talking with Haiti, this starts at home, right? It's not about the, the professor or the politician or, or the mayor. It starts at home. What is your footprint? How much water you waste? How much waste you generate? How much energy you consume? How much uh, bandwidth you're wasting? I mean, it has to start at home. And this is one of the challenges in the Peace Engineering Consortium. We wanna measure, it's about metrics, IoT, so we can work with big data, data science, so we can come up with a peace awareness map. And that's one of the challenges that, and it's doable. But I want to thank everybody. Uh, any other question, comments from the audience? If not, Haiti, thank you so much. We got so much to do. Uh, this was a, a great place to connect with, other, with new people. It's time to make a difference and have fun, like I say. Thank you everybody per, for participating. I really appreciate it. Katie, thank you so much. Alfredo, Thanks, let's thank you. Connect. Great talk. Thank you. Bye -bye. Raj, let's continue the conversation. Thank you. Yes, thank you.